This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, this is Deborah Kassoff from MPB Foundation. You're already listening, so you know the value that Mississippi Public Broadcasting adds to your day. But you might never have thought about what keeps the doors open and the lights on. MPB receives support from a variety of sources, but without listeners like you investing in the homegrown content and trusted information you count on, there would be no MPB. This week through October 24th, pitch in any amount to be entered into our daily drawings. Call or text GIVE to 888-372-4483 or visit mpbonline.org or click the link in the description. Everyone at MPB thanks you. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Now, college kids have won the right to be compensated for their name and likeness. Uh, those, those that are on scholarship, blah, blah, blah. Adults can now gamble on college sports. We're going to talk about these new laws concerning making money off of college sports. We can't take your legal calls today because we would love for you to call and make a contribution to support in legal terms and MPB. That phone number to call in is one 888 372 give 1 888 372 4483. Or if you don't feel like talking to a person, you can just go to mpbonline.org and click on giving. Good morning, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. It, it is, you know, when people give, they're, uh, they, they're supporting. Uh, the availability of volunteers like like Ron Rieschlock, who, who is on our show today, to be part of the show. He's given so much generous time uh, to this show, and he is a uh, distinguished professor of law, Jamie L. Witten, chair of law and government, uh, and the faculty athletics representative for the university. And, and that's the, his capacity that we're going to talk to him today, because we're talking, as you mentioned, about all the things going on in amateur sports that, that have really changed over the past uh, year or two. Um, and so, Ron, uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you for, for taking the time with us. Um, among your many areas of expertise, which would take the entire hour to, to discuss, and I really mean that, and, and I say that humbly, um, you're a leading expert on sports and gaming law. Uh, and tell us how you, how you got interested in that topic or those topics. Well, thanks, Richard. It's great to be here. I always enjoy our conversations um, here on the radio or when we're in the hallways just talking. Um, my my intro into gambling and gambling law started back in the 1980s when I was an attorney in Chicago and the Illinois State Lottery uh, was in place and they were looking to develop some some video lottery games to put in restaurants and bars throughout the state. And they had some legal questions. The company that made them was Bally's, the pinball company. And uh, Bally's wanted to help put these things in. They wanted to take away any kind of illegal gambling devices because they were in the bars and taverns around Chicago. And they didn't want to touch their bread and butter, which is games like Pac-Man. So how do you draw a law up that is going to take away illegal gambling but not touch pinball games and Pac-Man, and that fell to my desk, and um, I worked on some legislation for a long time when I came to academia, where it's publish or perish. I said, you know, I know something that almost nobody else knows about, and uh, I started writing about it. Well, it's great, and, you know, you have written a lot about it, and, uh, and, and you know, teach a class in, in gaming law, and, and, you, and our, you've been involved, involved with our sports law uh, program from the beginning. And so, um, now, you know, we're in a new area, era right now. I mean, things have definitely uh, changed, things that I never thought would, would change in some ways, but it's probably good that they have. But uh, so one of the areas of change is this the concept of NIL, um, name, image, and likeness. Can, can, what is that all about? Well, and this all started, and I'm sure a lot of listeners used to play the, the video games, the, the EA sports games, 
um, then they'd be based on either pro or college teams. And they would, the old games, you go back 10, 15 years, they had the players' names and you were playing certain players in certain schools and stuff. And there's a former basketball player who's looking at one of these games at O'Bannon and he sees his name there and he realizes that he's not being compensated for this. And so there was a long piece of, of litigation that, that wound its way through the courts. And ultimately, uh, the courts determined that if you're taking someone's name or image or likeness, they're entitled, and for a commercial purpose, they're entitled to be compensated, even if they are athletes. So that segment comes along some there's back and forth because the NCAA that's opposed to the NCAA's definition of amateurism uh, and ultimately what kind of broke the back was uh, first California but then Mississippi right alongside legislatures uh, passed laws that said uh, schools or other organizations are not going to be able to prohibit uh, student athletes from profiting from their name image and likeness and that put those states in direct conflict with the NCAA and fundamentally the NCAA blinked and the NCAA was going to have to exclude these states from its from its schedules and obviously that wouldn't work so the NCAA modified the rules allowed student athletes to be uh, compensated for use of their name image or likeness in commercial enterprises and a whole industry is blossoming right before our eyes well that's Let's ask about that because there's a, a company called Brandar, um, and what is, what is that? And that's part of that industry. And, and how do they interact with athletes? Well, it's absolutely part part of that industry because it's fun. The state legislatures, when they put in these laws to allow student athletes to be compensated for the name, image, and likeness pretty much precluded the schools from facilitating this. So the student athletes have to, uh, negotiate the deals independently um that there's a there's a huge disconnect there so people who want to get the endorsement from the student athletes or student athletes who want to be compensated for use of their name image and likeness need somehow to make uh, connections so there are uh, uh, companies that are helping the uh, the sponsors there are companies that are helping the schools and for this limited purpose of negotiating uh, name image likeness deals, the NCAA uh, has dropped a long time prohibition on agents. And so a student athlete now can have an agent to represent them in that arena, not in other arenas, but in, in the arena of uh, negotiating for compensation for their endorsements and such. I love it that things usually don't work out the way the experts think or or maybe they did think this and I just didn't hear about it but you know the the inspiration for all of this came from a guy who saw his name on a video game and so I'm assuming a lot of these college athletes are thinking oh I can get a Nike contract or I could you know get money from video games but some of these JSU football players are getting money from hair care. And there was an Arkansas Razorback, and he's getting money from, I think it's Pet Smart because he has a husky dog that is famous on Instagram. And I, I love it that these sponsors aren't quite the name, image, and likeness experts might have thought of. No, that, that's absolutely correct, Liz. I mean, the, the, a lot of the endorsers are local. Um, a lot of the, the work that's done by the student athletes really is on, on social media. They have to, you know, they make some posts, they endorse things, and, and it can, it, there, there's a, a deal here in town with a, a blue jean company. Uh, the whole football team could get a, a, a very nice tailored uh, pair of blue jeans. Bespoke, uh, uh, bespoke blue jeans. <laughs> right. So it's uh, so anyway, it, it's uh, really it, it's it's a fascinating area to be looking at and studying and, and being part of. You know, you, you, I'm so glad you brought that up, Liz, because the you know the the blue jeans are, are a perfect example of something that would have been prohibited previously. You know, uh, as as kind of something that was not allowed under the NCAA, and now that really it's hard for them to stop those uh, uh, those gifts essentially or those endorsements those payments 
by uh, people who are supportive of the athletic program. Yeah, but, yeah just to be clear, these are supposed to be uh, a compensation for you. So, so the, you know, if you wanted the blue jeans, you had to post some images, I think, on it. Uh, it, it does not mean that schools can, play, can pay athletes now. Uh, for instance, I know a group of, of, uh, of fans of the baseball team said, hey, there aren't very many scholarships. Can we pool money together and create more scholarships and give more money to our baseball players? No, uh, they're allowed to profit off their name, image, and likeness, but schools are still not allowed to pay athletes uh, for their play. And we're going to get into more of that. This is a special in legal terms today. It's our pledge drive. We can't take your phone calls for our show. You can always send us an email, legalterms at mpbonline.org. I'm Liz Gill, and I'm with our expert host, Professor Richard Gershon, and our guest, Professor Ron Rischlack. In Legal Terms is brought to you by MPB listeners who are also supporters. This is radio for the community, supported by the the community and you 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 are the community it's our fall on air fundraising campaign so give now the phone number you can call is 1-888-372-4483 or do your part for the love of mississippi on our website mpbonline.org Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lewis, Hall Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Paul write a song called Blue Suede Shoes that was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. is in legal terms. Now, not everyone has a chance to listen to our show live, so if you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as are all our local shows. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. During this special fundraising campaign show, we're not taking your phone calls, but we are talking about the rights of individuals to profit off of their name and likeness, also the right to bet on sports for amateur athletes. And we're so grateful that we have our guest, Professor Ron Rischleck, to help guide us through this conversation. Yes, it's a great conversation, Liz. Really, uh, you know, fascinating. And we, you know, we talked about the NIL rules. I, I was I talked to Ron before the show about uh, a while ago about um, I was bothered a few years ago when AJ Green was playing for the University of Georgia and he got some swag as as the players get swag from a bowl game that he participated in. And he got uh, in trouble, and the, and the university got in a little bit of trouble too for him selling that swag. And that always bothered me. It felt like okay, if that's his, he should be able to. He should be able to profit from it if he can. Um, but, you know, that there are also some people who advocate that the players should be able to be paid directly uh, by schools. Um, where are we on that? Or, or do you think that's going to happen? Uh, and can that happen right now? Well, right now, Richard, that uh, could not happen under NCAA regulations. Now, within the past two weeks or so, the, the head of the National Labor Relations Board spoke out in favor of the ability of student athletes in um, private universities because there's different issues with state employees uh, being able to unionize which would uh, certainly open up possibility of some uh, movement in that direction if you look back across history it's funny i love watching old movies i even even frankly old three stooges shorts going back to 1930s that involve uh, college football players and college presidents and alumni trying to get the you know get the star pro players sneak them in. They're not really students. There are, there are a lot of movies about that, and there, there, are, there are comedy shorts about that. So this idea of schools really wanting to win and really wanting to get the best players goes way back. It's not a new thing. There was a period of time, in fact, when uh, colleges were permitted to have up to three professional players on their team. 
the NCAA, by the way, the NCAA and the, the Big Ten uh, as well, put in a lot of these regulations we have today, originally a safety type regulations to make sure we weren't having students who were getting hurt uh, while they were playing. And, and there was a, a point in time where football almost got banned. Uh, but it, the, the, it, it has grown and morphed and become such a, a, a different animal than it was even 30 years ago that uh, it's appropriate to, for us to be re-examining and looking at you know what's right and what's wrong and and you know how can we uh, protect the safety assure the fairness of the game and yet let um, people uh, you know have a right to uh, make a living and, and and support their families yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting interesting question when you think about amateurism. I mean, it certainly has changed in the Olympics uh, con you know, concept of, of what amateurism is. Um, especially, you know, now we have NHL players playing in the in the uh, Olympics, you know, and and, and right. NBA players. But um, so, it, but I mean, what, I I think my problem with getting my arms around a payment system would be how would it work? Uh, you know, how would how would we make that work? And, how would it affect um, less known athletic uh, sports like you know fencing and things like that? Well, I, I think realistically, it sort of won't work. I mean, I think there's a practicality limit to it. First of all, you know, let's recognize that at most schools, at most big schools, uh, football makes money and everything else loses money. Some schools, basketball makes money. At the University of Mississippi, baseball also breaks even to maybe makes a little money. But virtually every other sport loses money. And the money that is made in the, the for-profit sports, so to speak, goes to the non-revenue uh, sports and, and supports those programs. Now, if you switch that compensation model around, if the money gets distributed back, does it get distributed back only to star players? Does it go, do we have different pay scales? Do we do, do those kind of things? Do, do you have to drop non-revenue sports because you no longer have the revenue coming in? There are very few athletic departments across the nation that actually contribute money back to the main university. Uh, in fact, the overwhelming number of universities that the academic side actually has to prop up the athletic side with money flowing in that direction. I mean, everybody thinks about all the money flowing in. Frankly, at, at, at most schools, um, not necessarily the SEC level, but most schools, uh, money has to come from the academic side to support athletics. Yeah, in fact, I was kind of, I was really kind of shocked when I was uh, living in Texas and talked to the provost at TCU. And he said, oh yeah, we're going to a bowl game. We actually lose money going to a bowl game because we have to pay to send the band there. We have to pay, you know, we have to buy a certain number of tickets. And I thought, would you get this big payout from the from the bowl? And he said, Oh yeah, that that does not even cover our costs. So that that surprised me, you know, just how costly these programs are. Yeah, no, it, it takes a lot to, 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 to move a whole team to. And 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 by the way, you know, when a team goes to a major bowl, the team goes for about a week, and if family comes, and there's there's tickets, and there's hotels, and there's there's all kinds of expenses associated with it. At the very biggest bowls, and, and when you throw in the television money, you know, it's probably still. A net profit, but it, but it's not the kind of enormous money that you think of if you're just a fan casually watching and, and your numbers get thrown around because there are tremendous expenses associated with that. Well, I mean, one question: if we compensated the athletes, what would happen to their scholarships? Would be an important question. Um, and and would they have to pay for their travel if, if you know if that was part of the compensation package? Well, I mean, you know, you're a tax guy. I mean, you, you know, first of all, the first issue with all this stuff is if we move into that model, are, are taxes going to be an issue? And frankly, with name, image, and likeness, we already recognize that, yes, indeed, they are an issue. And there have been, uh, I'm, I'm aware of, of a case where there was a significant non-monetary, a lot of compensation that's being offered right now is non-monetary. In other words, products, blue jeans, use of a car, a uh, 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 merchandise swag if you will um that's income and it's not employee income it's independent contractor income which means it gets taxed uh at the beginning so you may be a star athlete uh you get uh, the use of a car and you get some clothes and you get this and you get and you're not really getting cash 
and April 15th rolls around and you've got you know, $15,000 worth of estimated income, but you didn't get any dollars. Uh, you've got to pay taxes on that. And, and we're trying to have serious educational efforts. I know we are here at the University of Mississippi, but I'm sure across the nation to make sure our student athletes are aware of those kind of things. And we're, we're trying to make sure no one gets in a situation that where, where they're in over their head. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I mean, even even uh, Olympic medals now are being treated as compensation, uh, and so you know their their non dollar non cash compensation is still taxable, and uh, and I think a lot of the athletes don't think about that. And and also the you know there is FICA withholding that they have to do their self employment tax on those things as well. So, um, you know, pluses and minuses of, of this new NIL system that's uh, done with non-cash. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned. I mean, I'll, I'll just interrupt for a moment. I, I'm aware of a scenario where uh, student athletes have, have not wanted to um, do the endorsements because it wasn't enough money and they weren't that worth it. These, by the way, these students are the most uh, they are the busiest students on campus. They practice, travel, competition, study halls, the mandatory meetings, community service kind of things. And then you're saying, um, you know, can you come and shoot a commercial or do a signing or do this or whatever? I'm aware of some student athletes who said, no, I don't want to do that. But the coach wants them to do that because the coach wants to use this for recruiting next year. Um, you know, and once we all say, hey, my, my players are making a lot of money doing this stuff. And so we, 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 that's an unanticipated uh, twist. You know, I, I think nobody really thought about how that can play out that way. Yeah, there's well, I think like with any new thing, it's going to have to be worked out and there are going to be complications for sure. Um, but you know, I, I, we, we, you mentioned uh, like the smaller sports and, and they're, they're, they're a lot, you know, they're not being so much revenue producing, but they do. I mean, they're important educational function. Our, you know, the tennis team here, the volleyball team, the softball team, all, you know, are a great opportunity for the participants and you know, the athletes who play on and they're, they're great athletes. Um, so would there be Title IX implications if you start to cut programs to, to pay, the, you know, the top athletes? You know, arguably there already are Title IX implications just uh, in the fact of the, um, Particularly with the team packages for NIL, where where uh, I, I think you a lot of people saw anyway. I know I know I saw when when someone basically uh, out of BYU hired all of the not hired oh, air quotes there uh, hired uh, all of the non scholarship football players and gave them all scholarships. Um, you know, is is there a comparable thing for women? Uh, or a women's team there. And I think there's not. Uh, I don't know how that would play out in the courts because it's not really a direct payment from the university. So may maybe it falls outside of Title IX. But there absolutely are issues. And if we find a situation where the football team is, has to use all of its money to, to compensate its players and we no longer can afford to fund soccer and tennis and volleyball and those things, then absolutely I think we, you know, we get into Title IX. So there can be a dramatic restructuring of how we use uh, athletic income uh, as we look into the future. By the way, you know, you and I use terms like Title IX and we just throw them around. So maybe we should say, what, what exactly does Title IX provide? Well, t Title IX, um, we all think of it in terms of athletics because that's where it, it pops up in the news most often. But frankly, any uh, entity and any uh, entity that, that, that receives federal funding uh, at, at any level, uh, so even though the University of Mississippi is a state institution, we, there's federal money behind it. Uh, you're supposed to uh, not foreclose opportunities on the basis of sex for men or women, and, and it shows up most often in sports, where prior to Title IX in the early 1970s, uh, lots of men's sports, not many women's sports, so there weren't many opportunities. Title IX tried to balance that out. It's still not completely balanced, uh, but, but tries to address the inequities there. Uh, and so... Uh, as title, as name, image, and likeness comes along, the opportunities are tend to be flowing to the high-profile sports. Although, 
our volleyball, uh, our, our women's volleyball team is doing pretty well here, and I think our women's soccer is doing pretty well too. But but still, probably not where football is, and probably not where basketball and baseball are going to end up being either. So, um, how, how do you, how do you balance that the free market? That, that's that's tough. It is tough, I mean, and and is that even the schools doing? If if it's just the player on their own going out and getting those opportunities. You know, I mean, the, I mean, the school's kind of in a rock and a hard place there. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that that's one place where, where the state law that forecloses the university from facilitating these deals may really help out the, the university because it, it sort of keeps out of that Title IX area. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, you know, do you think, I mean, I never thought we'd have beer in the SEC at games, and now we do. Uh, do you think as a conference that the SEC would ever allow compensation of athletes? Well, I mean, that, that's a good question because uh, as we people are saying we could move into a post NCAA era, I don't think NCAA will, is going away anytime soon. I think perhaps the, the autonomy group, the so-called Power Five conferences, uh, will see probably some more division, some more autonomy. Um, but as those things happen, uh, conferences will have the ability to do more or less and regulate more or less. Most of the litigation is focused on the NCAA uh, as opposed to conferences. And I think uh, it's less of an issue if a conference imposes uh, a, a rule that perhaps said, you know, our, our schools are not going to compensate athletes. I think if the Big Ten is paying and the Pac-12, you know, the Pac if they're paying, I think that there's immediate competition kicks in. No one wants to be at a competitive disadvantage in recruiting the best athletes. So I don't see those big conferences restricting um, re restricting payments. If, if they all agreed to do so, we'd have an, uh, an antitrust and an anti-competition uh, agreement that would probably, like, probably couldn't hold. And if one allows it, I think they'll all allow it. So. We've got a special in legal terms show today. It's our pledge drive. I've got an email that we just got in that I think our two hosts will enjoy hearing. It's from, uh, my name is Zach. I don't know that I'll give his last name, but it is a nice one. Former student of both Professors Rischleck and <laughs> Professor Gershon. I'm sitting at my desk practicing law and listening to in legal terms. I just wanted to give a shout out to these two distinguished sh scholars and judges. Gentlemen, when I was taking wills and estates, I thought to myself, I am never going to need this. There are firms that specialize in this stuff. How I was wrong. When you get admitted to the bar, friends and family think you are capable of doing everything under the sun. I probably used what I learned in Professor Rischleck's class on a more day-to-day -day basis, evidence in particular. All right, so I have no idea what evidence means. So, uh, Professor Gershon, we need to schedule Professor Rushlock to come back and talk about evidence sometime. But we want to thank our listeners. Thank you for listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Our fall on-air fundraising campaign is on, and we are asking you to give for the love of Mississippi. It's important that we hear from you while you have a few minutes to spare. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. Hey there, it's David Green. You know, there comes a time when you've just got to let go of that old vehicle. Maybe it has lots of great memories, but it's also maybe just taking up space. And selling it can be such a hassle. So here's one thought. Let this station take that vehicle off your hands. Proceeds from the sale benefit this station, and you could get a tax break. Thanks. Donate your car, motorcycle, boat, or RV by going to mpbonline.org. Thank you. 
You are listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We so hope that you will subscribe to our podcast. Lots and lots of different podcasting platforms out there. I think I went looking, and there's a, over a dozen. Whatever one that you like, search for the title In Legal Terms, add it to the podcast that you subscribe to. That way you can be notified when any new episodes are loaded up. This morning, it's our drive time, so we're not taking your phone calls as questions. You could send us an email, though. Our email address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking about the new rights that some college athletes can use, can exercise of being compensated for their name, image, and likeness, and I think we're going to start getting into the fun part. The adults in the room can start betting. In fact, this was one of our fun things we did. We made a trip to the coast um, a few weeks ago. Ooh, oh, wait. Uh, we, we wanted to bet on the College World Series, but that wasn't an option on the video selections. We did beat—oh, dear. We did beat uh, pick um, the University of Texas for national championship. Champions in football. I don't think that's going to happen. Oh no! And we had bit. I had a bet on the White Sox to win the World Series because when I made that bet, they were doing awesome. But uh, uh, Professor Ron Rischlack is with us along with our expert host Richard Gershon. Well, I mean, you know, gambling is one of those things you do it for fun, and and uh, and. If you lose, you lose, but, you know, it's kind of fun to play. But, uh, you know, obviously part of part of what happens with gambling and that we're concerned about is always that that addiction side. And I know Ron um, has written about about all that, all those aspects. But let's talk about sports gambling because you, know, you were on the show um, uh, previously to talk about sports betting. It was just becoming legal um, and, uh, you know, and, and where it was legal. But I know as faculty representative, uh, for the university uh, to the athletics program, you got to have some concerns about sports betting. How, how are those playing out and what are those concerns? Well, that's a great question, Richard. Thank you for that. The, um, the, we have one of the first things we were concerned about is what sort of influences are going to be hanging around the team and what's going what's to happen. Is there going to be pressure? Are we going to see roommates selling information or placing their own bets or, or doing whatever? I don't think um, we've seen the dramatic shift uh, just yet. Uh, the thing that I think is coming, they have in Tennessee and in many other states, is when you can place f bets on your phone. Um, I think that that's going to be an enormous issue, not only for student athletes, for students in general. Um, th there's a guy here on campus, George McClellan, he and I have, have uh, done a, 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 I've, I've done some presentations with him and back and we've done some things together. Uh, and he is the one who really opened my eyes to this is not just being a matter for the athletics department to be worried about, but uh, we're going to have students who get caught up in gambling across the board. It's going to be an issue comparable to drugs or, or alcohol abuse uh, that we need to really be on top of and understand and uh, um make sure that somebody hasn't spent their family's fortune before you you figured out what's going on yeah i know and it's something that you know it's it's almost too easy i i, I we asked i asked you last time about DraftKings and, and some of the other online sports bet programs that as far as i know are still not legal in mississippi is that correct they're not legal in Mississippi right now, unless you're on the grounds of a casino. So uh, right, right now you can you can bet remotely if you're at a casino, which is kind of funny. But uh, I, you know, I think there will be pressure to follow so many other states, uh, and then there's going to be that time when you know you you can be at a game or you can be at home and you're watching three games on your TV sets, and you're going to be getting messages from the casino saying, "Hey, you're up, you're up so far. You want to parlay with this fourth bet." And, they're going to know, you know, what teams you like, what kind of bets you like, you know, where you shop. They're, they're going to have all that information, and uh, they're very good at targeting people already with uh, uh, encouragements to gamble. So it, it's it's going to be an issue. Well, I, I remember when I was in college. I, I have to admit, we it wasn't 
legal per se, but somebody in my attorney would figure out a way to do a parlay sheet, and you know we'd bet you know, a couple of dollars. And uh, if you got three teams, there your three teams won. You got the pool or whatever it was. It was pretty harmless. But now, now uh, we but we were betting on outcomes of games and not like everything that can, you can bet on now. So talk about some of that. I mean, it seems like you, you sent me an interesting uh, article about betting on an athlete's heart rate during a game uh, as a possibility. Uh, yeah, you, you can do, you can, you can bet on anything. Now, one of the very important things that the universities uh, here in Mississippi, at Mississippi State, University of Mississippi, Jackson State, and Southern, uh, the the council and the, the, the university council and the ADs, and I got to be part of the group, went and met with the Mississippi Gaming Commission and before a casino can offer what they call a prop bet, and that's anything other than bet on the outcome of the game, in order for a casino to offer a prop bet, it has to be authorized by the Mississippi Gaming Commission. We got a commitment from the Gaming Commission. They will not authorize prop bets on an individual collegiate athlete. So you're not going to be able to bet whether somebody makes a field goal or hits a three-pointer or scores above a certain or below a certain number of points. Uh, they're not going to have those kind of things on college athletes because that's where we think the most pressure could be on somebody to cheat, to, to shave points or, or whatever. Uh, we didn't want to have that kind of pressure on, on an individual uh, student athlete. Um, those kind of bets may be offered on pros. Um, and, and, and with metrics today, you can bet on anything. You can bet on you know, what the next – what the next batter in a baseball game is going to do. Is he going to get a hit or ground out or strike out or whatever? I mean, it's you're, the, pretty with the phone betting, you're capable of doing that kind of stuff. And um, and, and there are going to be some people who are going to love those kind of bets and, and place those kind of bets. And those kind of bets usually are, number one, they're so fast and, and, and ongoing uh, that it's really easy to get in a big hole really fast. And also, it, it's also that your energy is up and the excitement is up when you're when you're betting consistently. It's actually one of the reasons we've seen dog and horse tracks go down, casinos going up, is that the, the dog races and the horse races are half an hour apart. You know, you place one bet and you place one bet. If if you're when you're making bets on on the spin of a wheel or throw up a dice or or the, the next uh, next play in a football game, it's continual action, but that's also the most dangerous kind of, of thing. Yeah, as opposed to what Liz was talking about when she bet on the White Sox. Well, okay, she's going to lose, but at least you know, that she had a whole season of that bet you know, to kind of enjoy that that bet was out there and that possibility was out there. Um, and uh, it does seem like, yeah, this is where it gets into, uh, well, I lost now. i got to bet again to, to win that back is, is, is where it gets to be problematic. Called the now, chase. what about – Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's called the chase syndrome. Where you're chasing losses. You're trying to make it up, and you get deeper and deeper usually. Yeah, it's, it's, and, uh, and, and really the, the house almost always wins. It's really a good rule even in sports betting. Um, now, what about that data then? I mean, what, do, do, do professional athletes own the right to their own data? I mean, so somebody's betting on my heart rate. I mean, do, do I have any, any proprietary right to that? Well, you know, I mean, the, the heart rate issue ha is still in the, the realm of theoretical. But data is very interesting. When uh, sports betting first became legal, and that relates to a Supreme Court case from a few years ago that overturned a federal law that prohibited most states from offering sports betting. Uh, when, when, so sports betting exploded in Mississippi and elsewhere. Uh, you know, suddenly we had the ability to, to bet on a, uh, a whole lot of different things. And the teams and the colleges, and one of the first things that the universities here in Mississippi asked for was an integrity fee. So we're going to have higher expenses associated with monitoring and everything. And everybody asked and you basically had to go to the state legislature for this and ask the legislature for 1% of the bets that are placed coming to the, the entities that are generating the, the results. And pretty much in every case, the legislature said, no, you're not going to get that. Um, the teams then have turned around and said, well, wait a minute, what about the data? 
you know, we're generating, do we, can we have a right proprietary interest in our data? The scores, if you will, but, but I mean, beyond the scores, all the various prop bets and kind of things, you know, with all the breakdowns, do we own that? And so th that's the current talk primarily with the professional leagues of seeing if there's some way they can capture some of this sports betting income by trying to monetize their statistics. Now, those statistics have been part of public good or you know, in public usage forever, so I'm not sure that it's going to be successful, but that's where the current effort is. Well, I think I'm going to so have weird. to uh, uh, wait a while between my bets if I have to drive all the way to a coast or drive all the way to a casino. But this certainly is an interesting topic. And, Professor Rischlick, we're so glad that you've given us some extra information. I'll have all of that on the website for this show, the podcast information. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you each week. And, you know, this is a always evolving topic. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the chance to, to be here. That's it's always been, great to have you on. Oh, it's always great. That'll wrap us up for today's In Legal Terms. So for Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts from the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. We hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on right. MPB Think Rock. Radio. If you are a supporter of MPB Think Radio, Thank you. Thank you for helping be a producer of In Legal Terms on our station. Our fall on-air fundraising campaign is happening now. Hit that red giving button at mpbonline.org or give us a call 888-372-4483.